Who remembers dial-up internet? Well, per YouTube analytics, probably about 40% of you. I'm 32 years old and probably in the last generation that's likely to remember dial-up as an everyday fact of life. Since most of you are as old or older than me, probably a lot of us remember it. And the memory always goes something like this. If you grew up in the 90s in particular, that's going to be the modem experience that you remember. The first part, of course, is dialing, the modem emitting touch tones to dial up the other party, either your internet service provider or a friend who you're going to deathmatch with. The second part is the handshake, which is the two modems talking to each other to determine what their common supported features are and what the line can tolerate in terms of speed so they can settle on a speed and feature set to use for the data connection. Now these were daily experiences for most of us, but they're actually very advanced features that didn't become available in modems until very late in the modem lifespan, or at least they didn't become available in the majority of modems. I won't dispute that this sound that we're all familiar with is the sound of the internet. Pretty much everyone who ever dialed up to the internet probably used a modem that worked like this. But if you're just a little bit older than the set that grew up with the internet, you might regard these noises as sort of newfangled and shiny still. Despite the strong cultural association between the two, dial-up modems were only the primary method of getting on the internet for maybe five to eight years before they were displaced heavily by broadband and are now almost non-existent. However, 20 years before the internet existed, modems were around and people were networking computers, but the modems they had were a lot different, a lot slower, a lot dumber. The first commercial computer modem originated not in the 80s, not in the 70s, but in 1959. And that year, AT&T, also known as the Bell Company, put out their first modem, the Model 101 Datafone. Datafone is what they called modems for the first couple decades that they existed. Awkward name, but I guess they thought modem was a little too technical. There are no verifiable pictures of the 101 on the internet or in any resource I've found. There's just this one apocryphal JPEG that's been floating around for years, which doesn't actually say it's a 101. So I'm not convinced that's what it looked like. But for 1959, it very well could have been this massive. However, Bell did make several variants, the 101 A, B, and C, which, as you can see in this picture here, were integrated into teletype machines. In their early years, the majority of modems were very likely used with teletypes. They were very commonplace at that time. The full name is teletypewriter, and as the name suggests, they're just typewriters that can be operated at a distance. The simplest way to use a teletype was to connect it to another one, either directly with a pair of wires strung between two buildings, or over an automated switching system called Telex that was much like the phone network, but just for teletypes. Once you were connected, whatever you typed on your machine would get typed by the machine at the other end, and whatever they typed would get typed by your machine. And that's it. They just type at a distance. But the way the teletypes identified which letters you were typing was by sending different series of pulses down the line, each one identifying a character from a predefined table. This made teletypes one of the earliest types of digital communication since they were originally made for use with the telegraph system in the late 19th century. However, they remained relevant to business communication well into the 20th century. So in the early 60s, when digital computers started to become viable on a large scale, teletypes were adopted as a common interface device. CRT-based terminals were not a common sight in the front half of the 60s, but teletypes were, and since they already used a digital interface, they were an obvious choice as input-output devices for computers. In this role, teletypes became known as TTYs for short, and they were probably the most common way people interacted with computers for the first half of the 60s. That first modem, the 101, only transmitted at the breathtaking pace of 110 bits per second, or 110 baud. Now, it takes a very long time to explain what the word baud means, but in this case, I'm using it to mean bits per second because nobody ever made a short word that means that. In other cases, baud does not mean bits per second, but in this video, it does. So for people who want to comment and be pedantic, don't. I know what I'm saying and why. Anyway, you slice it, 110 baud is not fast. Uh, for instance, here is the B-movie script being transmitted at 110 baud, and I'm pretty sure you could watch the entire movie in the time it would take to send the script at this speed. 13 characters per second was probably fine for most teletypes, since many of them couldn't print any faster than 10 characters per second anyway, and the key travel on these things was often so long you'd be hard pressed to type any faster than that, so really a match made in heaven. However, people did have things that could transmit faster than a teletype. Computers, certainly, uh, but also people had punch card readers and paper tape readers which could transmit as fast as they could move the tape or the cards. And the faster you transmitted data, the shorter your phone call could be, which meant you paid less for it. 
This meant that there was definitely an incentive for faster modems, and AT&T did make some. In 1962, AT&T did put out a faster modem, a modest offering, really, just the next obvious step in their existing product line. But for whatever reason, the ripples from that product release were felt for over half a century and are still affecting us today. That modem was the Model 103 data phone, and I don't have any good pictures of that one either, uh, but we do have good illustrations demonstrating that it was, like Randy Johnson, a big unit. It was also a much faster unit. It transmitted about three times quicker than the 101 at 300 baud, but in most other regards was pretty much the same thing, just quicker and smaller. However, for murky reasons, the 103 would go on to become one of the most enduring data communication standards in history. Case in point, here is a modem from 1979, some 16 years later, which transmits at 300 baud. And here is a modem from 1983, 21 years later, which transmits at 300 baud. Here's a modem from 1999, 37 years later, which transmits at 300 baud, if you ask it to. And there are devices being made, as you watch this video today, current production products, which also transmit at 300 baud, and every one of these will talk to a Bell 103 data phone. I don't even need to tell you that it didn't take 40 years to improve the speeds of modems. You know that. We all know it doesn't work that way. Even if you're 19 and you weren't there for any of this stuff, electronics just moves faster than that. And you'd be right. By 1975, you could get a modem that would do 1200 baud, which is at least four times faster than this thing. So what were people doing buying modems this slow in 1983, let alone 1999, let alone now? What possible explanation could there be for this? Well, I can't answer all the questions, but I can fill in some of it. And it might help, since we have a couple Bell 103 compatible modems here of different types, for us to go through and see how they behave, talk about how they work, and then we can come back and tackle the question of why they managed to define network computing for a couple decades and are still relevant 59 years later. Of all the gear I've assembled to demo this today, I'm going to start by bringing us back to this guy here. This is the Innovation Cat. It is from 1979. It is a 300 baud modem. Apparently one of the first modems to gain large scale hobbyist uptake in the market. So apparently fairly legendary as a result. The device itself is not terribly sophisticated, uh, but the first thing we have to do is address the elephant in the room. What are these about? It sure doesn't look like much of a modem, does it? I mean, these things here, look like steam vents or something, and there's actually nowhere to plug in a phone line at all. So on first glance, it's not at all clear how this thing could be a modem. Well, collectively, these things are called an acoustic coupler, and this device is called an acoustic modem, and it's called that because it uses sound waves to connect to the phone line. As you may recall, computers used to have serial ports on them. They're a very simple form of digital communication. They send ones and zeros in the form of plus or minus 12 volts. A one is 12 volts, a zero is minus 12 volts, and that's it. It's nominal anyway, sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower, but it's about 12 volts. Before USB and Ethernet, this was the best way to get data in and out of a computer to anything else. Well, there was that, but... So when you got online, you plugged your modem into that port and it turned your clean digital ones and zeros into awful squawking noises, as anybody who picked up the phone while they were on AOL will recall. But the purpose of the modem was not really to make noises. It's more accurate to say that modems create audio frequency signals, which if put into a speaker will produce sounds you can hear, but they're not supposed to do that. They're never supposed to actually wobble the air. So why do modems produce something sound-like if they're not meant to produce sound? Well, the reason is they're meant to send data over the phone system, which is designed to send sound only, not data. Suppose your serial port is sending a file as a bunch of ones and zeros, and it has to send a whole bunch of ones, one, 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 one. Well, if you look at the port, what you're going to see is plus 12 volts, continuing till the end of the string of ones, and then it'll drop back down when a zero comes. Well, the phone network, it doesn't do that. It only passes signals that are shaped like the human voice, which according to the phone company means it has to wobble at between 300 and 3400 oscillations per second. Since your serial port doesn't necessarily do that, its signals that are outside of that range just get filtered out and thrown away basically. The solution to this problem is the concept of modulation, which I've spoken about before. The basic idea is if you have a signal that won't pass to a particular medium, you put it inside of a signal that will pass to that medium. The modem turns your digital ones and zeros into oscillations that the phone system will accept, a process called modulation. The modem at the other end receives those and turns them back into ones and zeros, a process called demodulation. That's what modem means, modulator, demodulator. 
The result happens to be that your ones and zeros become something that a speaker can reproduce as sound, but that's incidental. The whole point is just to cheat the phone network, which is why most modems, like this one, skip the step of actually making sound and just plug straight into the phone line. But this modem can't be connected to a phone line. It doesn't have a jack for it. However, if we hook it up, turn it on, give it a signal from a computer, it sure will make modem noises. Sure, sounds like the modem noises we're familiar with, but with your 90s modem, the only time you actually heard those sounds was during the dial-up process because they were actually a diagnostic tool. The modem had a speaker on top that it used to make those noises just during the connection process so you could diagnose it if something went wrong. Very few people actually knew what to do with those sounds, but that is the only reason they were there. You could actually turn them down or off completely and it wouldn't affect the function of the modem at all. But with this one, those sounds are critical. They're being produced by a speaker in this cup here. And in this cup, there's a microphone and they happen to be spaced at about the, yeah, you put a phone handset in it. That's, that's, that's what it's for, yeah. The modem has a speaker and a mic, and the handset has a speaker and a mic. They're flipped, so each one meets the other one. When the modem produces its signal as actual oscillations in air, the phone handset turns those into electrical oscillations. And then when the other modem's oscillations come back up the line, the phone turns them into sound, which the modem on this end then turns back into the electrical oscillations that it wanted. So, notionally, the signal this modem gets from the sound is the same as the signal that was actually on the wire. It just has to be audio for a sixteenth of an inch. This looks kind of clever, but you've probably already guessed it's terrible. This was not a great way to do things. It was just unfortunately necessary for a while. Some viewers might be aware that it used to be illegal to plug your own equipment into the phone network. But by 79, that hadn't really been true for over a decade. In fact, in 77, you could buy a modem with a phone jack, like this Vatic here, and just plug it straight into the wall. My other modem here from 83 will also do that. But here's an issue of popular science showing that acoustic modems were still available for sale in 1984. In fact, Novation was still selling the cat for $189. They were selling a direct attached version as well, which was only $10 more. So acoustic modems continued to be in vogue despite their drawbacks. And what drawbacks were those? While the design of the acoustic coupler is clever, when you have a phone on there, it's going to produce a resonant cavity in the interface between the speakers and microphones. That's going to tend to destroy the much more precise signals used by virtually every other modem modulation that was ever invented. This could get even worse if you didn't seat the handset perfectly because you could put it on here and it could pop out a little or you could get a little further in on the top than the bottom it's 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 very it's very messy it's very hard to get it to actually seat in there all the way the coupler also doesn't fully isolate external noises so if i were to yell into this that would probably make its way into the signal and i would guess that the echo control and filtering circuitry in the telephone itself are none too kind to precise modem signals so while you probably could put a higher bit rate modem signal into this i doubt it would ever make it to the line intact like I said, I'm guessing about a lot of that, but as I said, pretty much every acoustic modem I've ever found is limited to 300 baud. In fact, if you look at that popular science modem roundup, all the ones that can go faster are direct connect designs. So what gives? If you could buy a modem that was smaller, simpler, more reliable, possibly faster, and just not silly, why would you buy one that wasn't any of those things? Well, one reason is that for a very long time, telephones were permanently installed fixtures. When the phone company came to your house to put in a phone line, they would also bring a phone and hardwire it straight into your wall. You couldn't unplug it to connect a modem. While that had changed for most new installations by the end of the 70s, there were still plenty of houses that had hardwired phones. Also, as we moved into the 80s, tiny portable computers started to become feasible, like the TRS-80 Model 100, which was apparently popular with traveling businessmen. If you were staying in a hotel room, you couldn't necessarily unplug the phone in your room to get at the jack to plug in your modem. But if you had an acoustic coupler, you were set to jet. People would ostensibly even use acoustic couplers with payphones in order to send a quick email while they were on the go. There might have been other issues the acoustic modem addressed, but at any rate, it remained popular throughout the 70s and 80s, and since virtually all of them were limited to 300 baud, and even the inexpensive direct connect modems on the market were also limited to 300 baud, that remained the lowest common denominator for modem speeds throughout those decades. Beyond the acoustic versus direct distinction, however, there was virtually no difference in how any of these 300 baud modems functioned. So I'm going to make a connection between the two different types to show you how they worked. All right, here's the setup. 
we have two imaginary houses here. This is all me over here, and this is my friend Jim who doesn't exist in an apartment across town. Now on my side, I have a terrible knockoff Bell 2500 set in this distasteful color of beige, and I have the Novation Cat acoustic coupler modem, and I have that plugged into my Weiss terminal. Now, this is a type of device uh, often referred to as a dumb terminal, or in past decades, a glass TTY, because its purpose, originally, was to simulate a teletype, but instead of smacking out the received characters onto paper, it saves them in memory and prints them on a screen. Now, this isn't quite a computer. It doesn't have any programs per se, and you can't program it. The only thing it does is display text that it's received and send text that you type. On Jim's side, uh, he has an actual 2500 set from Western Electric, the good stuff, and then he has the Mira Mini modem. That's my 1983 direct attach 300 baud modem. And then he has a laptop. Now this is running a much later, completely anachronistic operating system, uh, Windows 98. Uh, however, I'll be running HyperTerminal on this, uh, which is a program that emulates a dumb terminal, which in turn emulates a teletype. So, I have two teletypes here. The reason I'm using such basic appliances here is because we want to see exactly what these modems are sending. If I were using like a modern network stack, such as TCP IP, that might cover up some of what the modems are doing. Maybe there'll be errors in the bitstream or whatever that they quietly correct by retransmitting bytes. Not so here. Whatever this computer sends will be exactly what this one displays unless something goes wrong. Ah, foreshadowing. So I'm ready to connect to Jim. Now you might think that the first step is to take the handset and put it on the coupler uh, so that the modem can dial his number. But neither one of these modems can actually dial on their own. There's a couple reasons for this, but one is that in 1979, not all phone lines actually had touch-tone dialing. It had been around for quite some time, but the Bell Company was still charging people to enable it. So a lot of lines still just did pulse dialing, like these old rotary phones. So this wouldn't be able to dial on there because pulse dialing works by disconnecting and reconnecting the phone line rapidly. And since this has no electrical connection to the line, it can't do that. Jim's modem is directly connected, so it could do this, but uh, dialing circuitry is fairly sophisticated. And as I'll show you in a bit, these modems are not very sophisticated. But probably a bigger reason is the handshaking process. Here's what the handshake process looks like. First, I call Jim. And I say, hey Jim, I've got that file you wanted. And he says, great, I'll answer, you originate. So Jim puts his modem in answer mode. When he does so, a deafening tone blasts down the line. So hopefully I've pulled the handset away from my ear at this point. He then hangs up his telephone set because the modem has the one feature which Direct Connect offers of holding the line open for as long as it's switched on. And then on my side, I set my modem to originate. And then I set the receiver on the coupler. And that was the handshake process. You call each other and discuss which settings to use on your modems. You see, these modems, even the directly connected ones, don't control the call in any way. They don't begin it, they don't end it. Humans set the call up, and then you turn your modems on and they just start going. They assume that the connection has been established and all the settings are already set. With the handset on the coupler, the ready light on the cat illuminates, which indicates it's receiving the carrier signal from Jim's modem. And likewise, there is a carrier detect light on there, which just means the two modems are hearing each other. At this point, we're connected and we can send data. So now if Jim types some junk on his laptop here, you'll see it show up on the terminal. And if I type on my terminal, you'll see it show up on the laptop. And you can actually hear this. If we pick up the handset here, there's the carrier. And now when Jim types, let me get that a little closer there. This modem connection is so simple that you are literally hearing the binary code representing different letters on my keyboard. Now we could just use this to chat at this point. Jim types and hits enter, and then I type and hit enter, but probably a lot more efficient to just call each other on the phone at that point. Now, if we both had computers, then we could maybe use Kermit or Z modem to send a file back and forth, uh, but I don't have that. Fortunately, Jim has HyperTerminal, which is capable of sending any file as plain text. So let's do that. Jim is now sending me the script to B-Movie at 300 bits per second. And although that is quite a bit faster than the 110 baud we saw earlier, we're still going to be here for a while. And that's a bummer, because I won't know when it's done. It could be sitting here for hours, and when it's finished, uh, Jim's going to hang up, but I'm not going to get any indication on my end that that happened. You see, my machine doesn't even know it's connected. If I pull the handset out of the coupler, 
You can hear it still screaming away. Jim's modem is sending me the bits for B movie, but they're no longer appearing on the screen because the sound isn't getting there anymore. But if I just put the handset back on there, there we go. It's back. I assume you don't know the script to B movie by heart. I hope you don't anyway. But if you did, you might notice that there's a gap. The letters that would have been sent when this was off the coupler are just gone. It picked up several seconds later. This is because Jim's machine has no idea that mine just went away. It just kept on sending bits out the serial port and the modem just kept on modulating them, even though there was no computer at the other end receiving them. I can actually uh, pick up the handset here, just sort of move it back and forth on and off the coupler. And when it's close enough, it'll start demodulating. And when it gets far away, it'll stop demodulating. And hell, I can turn the modem off. Still going. Uh, and then turn it back on, put this bad boy on here. And there we go. It's possible for the computers to detect the carrier loss and give up on transmitting, but the point is that the modems can't do that. They don't have the intelligence to do that at all. In fact, these modems are as simple as they could possibly be. While some kinds of modulation are hard to understand, and in fact later modems are absolutely baffling, the Bell 103 is dead simple. This is because it uses a modulation called Frequency Shift Keying, or FSK, which is so simple I can explain it in one sentence. If you want to send a zero, you beep at one frequency. And if you want to send a one, you beep at a second frequency. I'm not kidding. That's literally it. This is a block diagram from a 103 compatible modem. The primary components are the frequency generator and discriminator. The generator makes tones and the discriminator tells you if it hears a particular tone. When the discriminator detects the tone for one, it outputs positive 12 volts. And the rest of the time it outputs negative 12 volts. That's it. There is no further capability in the receiving circuitry. The generator does the exact same thing in reverse. If the computer sends 12 volts, it puts out one tone. And if the computer sends minus 12 volts, it puts out the other tone. Those are the only parts of the modem that are active. The rest are just support components, timing crystals and filters and that sort of thing. This modem is not aware of any state. It doesn't know whether it's connected or not. It doesn't know whether there's another modem on the other end. It doesn't know anything. All it does is listen for noises and make noises. For this to work, of course, the modems have to agree on what's a one and what's a zero. The Bell 103 established those two frequencies and they've never been changed. And the modems have to be able to tell which one of them is sending the signals. If they both use the same pair of frequencies, then they might hear their own data as if it were coming from the other modem. But to solve this problem, the Bell 103 uses two different pairs of frequencies, one for the answer side, one for the originate side. That's why when I called Jim, he said he'd put his modem on answer. That way I knew to put mine on originate so they don't collide with one another. I don't think it matters who does which as long as both modems are on different settings. Now, if I haven't made my point yet, this system is so simple that the other end of the connection doesn't actually have to be a modem. For instance, here's a recording of a Bell 103 modem. If I put this up against the mic here, how about that? It's being demodulated. It doesn't care if there's no real modem on the other end. That doesn't matter in the least. A 90s style dial-up connection is an intimate conversation between two modems. They're not just sending through the data that the computers are transmitting, they're also having a conversation directly with one another, talking about the state of the line and whether there need to be any changes, like changing in and out of data mode or to voice mode, or maybe shutting down the connection when the computer decides that the session is over, that sort of thing. But these earlier modems don't do any of that. The 103 compatible modem doesn't talk to your PC. It doesn't talk to the other modem. It doesn't talk or think. It contains no computer at all. All it has are some basic electronic components that convert logic levels into tones. So at the end of the connection, it doesn't do anything. Not until the user reaches over and switches it off. This lack of intelligence is also why these modems can't dial numbers on their own. There's no computer in there to receive the command from your PC to tell it to start dialing. In the early days of modems, you could buy something called an auto dialer, which was a device you sat next to your modem. Your PC would tell that to dial a number. It would connect the call and then hand it off to your modem to actually do the data transaction. Then when you were done with the call, the auto dialer could disconnect it. This is what made early unattended data connections possible. Eventually, in the early 80s, the Hayes smart modem changed all of this. It added a microcontroller to the modem that you could actually have a dialogue with from your PC. You could tell it to place a call. You could tell it the parameters of the call, such as the speed and features that you wanted. You could even save speed dial numbers straight into the modem. These were very popular. They got cloned by every other manufacturer right away, but of course, they cost quite a bit more. I'm sure some number of users had auto dialers, and eventually everyone would have smart modems, but Prior to the internet, for which 300 baud just wasn't fast enough, I think that 
these guys with their fully manual dialing and handshaking process were probably pretty much the norm. Nonetheless, the simplicity of these modems is why they persisted for such a long time and why they continue to have a role in the modern world. Their sheer stupidity means that they aren't very hard to build, they're not complex to configure, and there's very little to go wrong. There are 103 compatible modems that work over radio, for instance, both amateur and commercial. The Canadian Institute for National Measurement Standards operates an AM radio station which transmits the time in Bell 103 format throughout the day for anyone who wants to build a device that needs the correct time but doesn't have access to the internet or an atomic clock or anything like that. There's no particularly special modulation or encoding, so all you need is a serial port, frequency discriminator, and an AM radio, and you're good to go. In addition to being simple to implement, the 103 signal is also extremely robust. Consider that if it can successfully demodulate the signal with the handset six inches above the receiver and a whole bunch of background noise, then the signal must be pretty much bulletproof. And it is. The tape I played earlier started life as a WAV file I generated on my PC. I put it on my smartphone, played it back over its little tinny speaker into the little tiny mic on the tape recorder, and then played back over its speaker into the acoustic modem. So the fact it made it there intact at all is pretty astonishing, but in fact I think it came through pretty much perfectly. But even without the extreme disadvantage of acoustic transmission, this simplicity could save you in a lot of other situations. Sometimes a business needs to communicate between computer systems and all they have is a nearly unusable telephone line. Suppose you're a paper mill in rural Ohio and you have process control equipment that needs to phone home to your headquarters in another state. Well, the only phone line you're likely to have is one that hasn't been maintained in nearly a century, or possibly longer. Maybe it's drooping through a pond. Maybe it's been pecked at by birds and there's no insulation on the wires. Maybe when you pick up the phone and listen to this line, it sounds like a power substation that's also a wind tunnel. If you try and put DSL over that, no way. 56K, not likely. 14.4, maybe, but you might not even be able to get a 4800 baud modem to run over it. I mean, some phone lines are truly atrocious. But if you put a Bell 103 on either end of that line, you'll get a message through. It won't be much. On the worst lines, you might have to resend your data over and over and over before it gets through, and you might only get a one byte per second effective throughput, but that byte could save someone's life. Fire alarm systems, for instance, still implement the Bell 103 modulation because in the worst case scenario where that awful phone line is the only working connection to the outside world, the one byte that gets through might mean send help. This is, I think, an example of how a marker for success can be the sheer stupidity of a solution. When every other option requires a bunch of front-loaded effort and expertise and expense, the one you can make with duct tape and bailing wire is the one you're going to see used everywhere where simple success and maybe low cost are more important than style, convenience, and performance. So the 103 was destined to be an enduring standard, and it was a de facto one for about 26 years until the ITU ratified it as the V.21 specification in about 1988. Although V21 isn't quite the same, unfortunately. I lied to you a bit earlier when I said that one of these can talk to one of these. I've tried it and it won't do it, I think because this is expecting some kind of handshake signal that they added when they ratified it. It's kind of a bummer. But I have heard that some modems can do it. So if you've got one you want to try, or if you have one of these and want to give it a spin, I'll put a phone number down in the description, which you can call to get a special message. Let me know in the comments if you succeed. Even if you never experience a 300 baud connection in all its sluggish glory, if you've ever used a dial-up modem, you've probably heard its modulation. This is because if you dial up from, say, a 33.6 modem to one that can only do 14.4, they don't know what their capabilities are. They have to talk about it first and negotiate. And the only speed that every modem knows that every other modem will speak is Bell 103 at 300 baud. So at the beginning of this modem handshake sequence, you can hear there a couple bursts of FSK signal, which are the modems discussing which speeds they support. After this, they will switch to a faster modulation and continue the call, but at first, they always start with a Bell 103. So AT&T's sophomore 1962 modem effort became an integral part of the tapestry of online computing for 20 years in the public eye and another 30 and counting in hidden corners of infrastructure and mission critical systems that most people don't even know exist. It's a critical part of the history of computer communications and anyone who's ever used a modem ought to know about it. And now you do. That's all I have to say about it, though. If you enjoyed this, uh, please subscribe so I know you like this sort of thing. Uh, turn the notifications on so you see my future videos. YouTube's really bad about showing them to people. And if you really like this, uh, consider subscribing to my Patreon because it costs me a lot of money to get all these modems. 
to the people already supporting me, I couldn't thank you enough. Here's the names of some of the people who are really showing their faith in me, but I couldn't do this without all of you. Thank you again, and thank you to everybody else for watching.